you section success language check section enlargement and in the adults in the women's section there will be reproduction and then in the church at large adult section you will succeed and the work will prosper in your hand in Jesus name every prophecy of the word will be yes and amen in your life and I too I will remain blessed in Jesus name say it for yourself you keep on being blessed in Jesus name Father we thank you for tonight we thank you for your people thank you for their faithfulness and thank you for the energy of the spirit and power of the spirit in their lives we're asking lord everyone without exception you will use in a greater measure in jesus name as we are preparing for this uh, coming retreat, the final solution, that is Jesus. I pray that any problem in any life of our minister, of our workers, anyone, there will be the final solution in Jesus' name. All our members, final solution. All our invitees, final solution. Lord, as we plunge ourselves into the ocean of your blessing, we pray that no one will be missing out in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. Let the joy of the Lord be the strength of your people. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Another good, good amen. God bless you. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 1. In the year that King Hosea died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims, each one having six wings, and with two in, that means with two, he covered his face. And with two in, that is with two, he covered his feet. And with two in, that is with two, he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth will be full of the glory of God. And the whole nation will be full of the glory of God. Through you and through me as we we'll spread the gospel, every community will be full of the glory of God in Jesus' name. And the post of the door moved and the voice of him that cried, and the, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean leaves. And I dwell in the midst of a people upon clean leaves. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from up the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves. Thine iniquity is taken away. And I seen a porch. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, everybody, Here am I, send me. He has sent us already, He will send us again. We have walked for God already. We'll keep on walking for God. We'll be committed unto the Lord. And we'll keep consecrated and committed to the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. You will not be tired. I will not be tired. Our church as a whole will not be tired in Jesus' name. Tonight we're looking at the message, our calling and consecration with absolute surrender. Our calling and consecration with absolute surrender. Here am I, send me. 
As you look at this, you need to understand that Isaiah had been working for the Lord before. He had been preaching the word that the Lord gave him. But now a new call came. A renewed call came. And when the renewed call came, who shall I send? The Lord did not mention his name. The Lord did not say, Isaiah, I want to send you again. I know you are working for God already. But you see, when the question came, it was a general question. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah did not say, let other people answer that call. I'm already doing this and doing this and doing that. You see, that's the attitude of some people. I'm leading house fellowship already. So when I hear that kind of call, my time is already well occupied. I'm in the youth ministry already. And I'm neck and shoulders into the work already. I'm into the district church. I'm into the group church. And because of what I'm doing, let other people... How many thousands do we have in the church? And how many of them are like doing nothing? And I've been involved in this, involved in that. Let other people respond to the call. But Isaiah said, whatever others do, whatever others do not do, whether other people respond or not, I will always be available. No matter how involved I've been, and no matter what I've been preaching, a new call has come. God must have a reason for telling me and asking me the question, whom shall I send and who will go for us? I must answer. I will answer. When the call comes again, I will answer. When there is a new thing to be done, and you see in the district, in the group, in the central church, we're looking for this, we're looking for that. You see, there are people, they don't care, they don't worry about the central church because they say, you know, in my district and in my locality, look at what I'm doing already. In my region, look at what I'm doing already. In my community, in my state, look at what I'm doing already. So whatever they have in the headquarters and whatever they have at the central church, I think somebody should answer that. That's a duty, but you will answer. I'm looking for you. I said you will answer. God will give you the grace you will answer in Jesus' name. Amen. Whom shall I send? That's God talking. And that God is one. That he is, is uh, the one that is saying, I, God, I want to send somebody. And then look at the next part. Who will go for us? Plural. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And even though it's one God, whom shall I send? Yet that God has three personalities. It says, and who will go for us? Plural. Then it says, here am I, send me. Tonight, as I said, we're looking at the message, our calling and consecration with absolute surrender. That means, I surrender. Without, uh, you know, tying some string on my sacrifice. And then when the uh, thing goes by the top, when times go hard, then I pull back. I surrender. That means I'm not holding some parts back and saying that, well, I must uh, make allowance for rainy day. And at the rainy day, I'll make use of that. I'll make use of that. God, I'm going to give you this. And then I'm holding on to this. Absolute surrender. Surrender, complete surrender, total surrender, entire surrender, or reserved surrender. Here am I, Saint me. You will surrender. You'll be surprised. Let me use this language. God will embarrass you with blessing. You'll be, blessings will be so many in your life that will say, I didn't even pray for this. I didn't even pray for this. From today, blessings will increase in every life in Jesus' name. I'm going to uh, look at four points with you. Number one, Isaiah's initial commitment to preaching with fearlessness. We need to do this so that you will know that Isaiah was not a journey just come. He was not a new hand. He was not a novice. He had been working already. And that leads us to point number one, Isaiah's initial commitment to preaching 
but fearlessness. Number two, an instructive confession and perception within the fold. He looked at the people around him and he saw their condition and he looked at himself and he saw his inner condition and we get instruction from that confession and the perception of the people around him. An instructive confession and perception within the fold. Number three, his instantaneous cleansing. The cleansing was not a gradual, little by little. Cleanse the heart now, cleanse the mouth later, cleanse the spirit later. Instantaneous, it's instantaneous cleansing and purging with fire. And purging with fire. Point number four is individual consecration. You know, Consecration is individual. It's one by one. I cannot say I'm waiting for my brother. I'm waiting for my uncle. I'm waiting for my relatives. I'm waiting for the one that uh, led me to Christ. I'm waiting for, you know, my seniors. I'm waiting for my colleagues in the faith. If they consecrate, then I will. If they surrender, then I will. It's individual. The individual consecration and pursuit with focus. That is, your have a focus, you have a drive, you have a destiny, you have a destination and you say, I will pursue to the very end. The spirit of pursuit will be upon your life. You know, somebody can be running and running and then when he meets some challenges and all that, then he gets tired, then he gets weary and then he says, you know, I wanted to do it, but you know, the people are discouraging me. I wanted to do it, but the people are drawing me back. I wanted to do it, but you know, the things I see do not encourage me. Nothing will discourage you. I said nothing will discourage you. Individual consecration and pursuit with focus. Let's look at number one. I say as initial commitment to preaching or fearlessness. Look at verse one. Look at verse one. Chapter six, verse one. In the year that King Josiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. That was a vision that he saw. The question is, was that the first time of seeing the vision of the Lord? Did he know God before this time? Or was he just knowing God for the first time? Isaiah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. Look at it, it says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Ezekiah, and kings of Judah, the kings of Judah. Let me explain this to you. It says, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which is so concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of, tell me, in the days of, shout it aloud, Uzziah. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Come back to chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the days of King Uzziah, Uzziah died, Isaiah was still alive. You will not die until you finish your work. And Jotham, Jotham took over. Jotham died, Isaiah was still alive. Looks like you're going to live long. Amen. Looks like your ministry is going to be very extensive. Amen. And then look at verse 1. And Ahaz, and Isaiah outlived Ahaz. And Hezekiah, and Isaiah outlived Hezekiah. You see, they came, they left, they came, they died, they came, they ruled, and they were gone. But Isaiah was still there. You know, I'm so happy for, you know, some of uh, our people, our leaders. You know, many, many years now, uh, we're part of that one. That one is gone, but you are still there. Another one is gone, and you're still there. When you get to your 60s, you'll be stronger. Your 70s, you'll be stronger. When you get to your 80s, and I see you, you'll be stronger in Jesus' name. 
but now, but now, let us look at his initial commitment to preaching in ways fearlessness. Look at verse 2, chapter 1, verse 2, here, O Hermos, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. He was talking to the whole nation. Think about a person that can stand and stand erect and stand firm and stand on two feet and stand with a shoulder squared and stand with a backbone and then look at the whole nation without looking down and without being timid and saying i lost you i nourished you as a nation but you've gone astray look at verse 3 the the ox knows his owner and the ass uh, also his master's grief uh, but Israel does not know my people does not consider a ah, sinful nation a people leading with iniquity a seed of evil doers this man was a fearless preacher you are going to be a fearless preacher Whatever the Lord has spoken, you will give it and you'll say it without any fear or timidity in Jesus' name. And it says, children that are corruptors have forsaken the Lord and they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. And they are gone away backward. Look at uh, chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 7, and see our prophet Isaiah, see him declaring the word of God boldly, courageously, and fearlessly. Chapter 6 was not the beginning of his ministry. He had been a ministering to the Lord, and uh, you are going to have an upliftment in ministry, a promotion in ministry. Do what you are doing now faithfully, and then an increase will come. Look at, look at chapter 2, verse 7. Their land is also full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end to their treasures. Their land is also full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land is also full of idols. And they worship the work of their own hands. And that, uh, that which their own fingers have made. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled. And the uh, haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. It just shows you how bold and courageous it was. It was so complete his mouth to talk. He wasn't, uh, you know, choosing his words. If I say that, that person may be offended. If I say that, the king may be offended. If I say this, uh, those, uh, you know, mighty, powerful, influential women may be offended. And therefore, they will not say what they ought to say. Nothing will close your mouth. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 16. Chapter 3, verse 16. It says, moreover, it said, The Lord has been sending me message to the kings and to the whole nation and to all the people, but now, moreover, I have a message for the ladies. Moreover, the Lord says, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and they walk with stretch forth necks, and their wanton eyes, and walk miss and missing as they go, making a tinkling in their feet. Therefore, the Lord will smite the, with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret places. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their Chinking ornaments about uh, their feet and about the, and their cores and their round tower tires like the moon, the chain, the bracelets, and the mufflers, the bonnets, and the ornaments on the leg, and the head uh, band, and uh, the tablets, and uh, the, the earrings. Look at Isaiah. I said, did not, you know, miss the word. He didn't say, I'm the only one preaching that. I'm the only one emphasizing that. And if I keep on emphasizing what all the preachers, all the prophets, all the whoever, all the evangelists are not emphasizing, 
shall become unpopular. He wasn't looking for popularity. He wanted to stand firm on the unchanging word of God. You will not look for popularity. He, he condemned the worldliness and the dressing of the women of the day. And he said, you are Israelites. And you say you are worshipping God. And look at how gaudy and how, how haughty and how proud you are. He even talked about how they walked and they, walked. they, they practiced their walking. They wanted to attract a man by their walking. And he told them, this is wrong. I like a preacher like that. That's the kind of preacher I want to be. I don't want to be a kind of preacher that is, you know, so timid and so afraid. And when I see worldliness among uh, people, I cannot talk and say, you know, I don't want them to criticize me. They may put it on the net. And then everybody will be passing comments. It's an old-fashioned man. It's this and that. And because of that, you know, we keep quiet and we cannot talk again. But you will talk. If we are the only one fighting against corruption, fighting against worldliness, we will do it like Isaiah with fearlessness in Jesus' name. You know, there are people that cannot, they are not even bold enough to correct their own children, their own daughters, or their own wives, or their own maids. And uh, they say, well, I don't want to incur the indignation and the anger of my wife and of my, of my friends and all that, and of the members of the church. So uh, they don't want to, so I will not tell them. You will tell them. I said, you will tell them, will go back to the scriptures and the scripture, the work of God will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. Hey, look at what it says in verse 24. It says, and it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. You know, they were using all kinds of pomade and all kinds of loving and all kinds of things, cosmetics, that you, well, even if they are maybe a kilometer away, you're already sensing and not, the odor is so strong because they want to, you know, look like this to the world. They don't care how they appear in the sight of God, but only in the sight of men. You will not be like that. I am not like that. I said I'm not like that. You'll be a straightforward, meek child of God without worldliness on you in Jesus' name. And it shall come to pass that instead of so smell, there shall be steam. And instead of a girdle of a rent, and instead of well set air boldness, and instead of a stomach, a girding of sackcloth and burning, inside, instead of, tell me, beauty. Uh, when it says burning, actually the burning came as a result of bleaching, bleaching. You know, they put uh, this on the face and also on the hands and also on the leg and the rest of the body is, you know, normal. And you see patches of black and patches of this and that because of the bleaching. A child of God who is a lady will appear neat without all those cosmetics and you'll be beautiful to God and beautiful to the people of God in Jesus name somebody say amen, amen. and then uh, here we come to chapter 5 I'm looking at chapter 5 uh, and I'm looking at verse 8 we're looking at the fearless preaching of Isaiah even before we come to chapter 6 look at chapter 5 uh, I'm reading from verse 6 woe unto them that join house to house and that, uh, that uh, leave field uh, to field till there is no place that, may, uh, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth it's talking about covetousness there and it says woe to them they want to be alone, they want to possess all the land. Before you get there, you want to buy the land, Mr. So and so has had it already. And before you get there, the same man has had it. Before you get to another place, the same man has had it. Land, pieces of land here, and parcels of land, another place, terrain, another place. They want to occupy the whole country.
country by themselves alone. And then when you eventually want a little plot, they sell a plot as if they are selling an acre because they want everybody to be down and only themselves to be up. And I see and noticed everything. It was a preaching theoretical message that didn't touch anybody, that didn't strike anybody. Your message will not be theoretical. Your message will touch the lives of people. Look at verse 11. One to them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, and that, uh, that continue until night, till the wine inflame them. Isaiah did not spare anyone. And he did not spare any kind of corruption in the community. He spoke to everyone and he spoke about everything. Look at verse 13. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished with a famish and their multitude it says uh, they are dried up well first look at verse 14 therefore hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and and he that uh, rejoices shall descend uh, into it. But did he give any solution? Of course he did. Look at chapter 1. I say chapter 1. I'm reading now from verse 16. I say chapter 1, verse 16. Wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doing from before my, my eyes and cease to do evil. Learn to do well and seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed and judge the fatherless and plead for the widows. Come now and let us reason together. You see, Isaiah was preaching repentance. He was just telling them, this is not right, this is sinful, this will damn your soul, and this will displease the Almighty God for a solution. And the solution is repentance. And he says, come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as carnage, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What he was saying is, you know, they've all these things to hang on the neck and put in the air and all that is offensive to God. All the pride and the show of pride in your appearance is offensive to God. Repent and get rid of them and be uh, beautiful in the sight of the Lord. And your repentance and your change of life will so interest God. God, he will bless you abundantly. Do Christians have to repent? Of course, yes. If Christians are sliding back, if Christians are becoming worldly, if Christians are already also having covetousness, if Christians are doing things that God says, that's not my will, that's not in my word, that's not the way of righteousness, that's not the narrow path that leads to heaven. You're already going in the broad way. The person who says he's a Christian will honor God, will fear God, and will repent. Repent, you repent in Jesus' name. And he will forgive. And he will set us free. Look at verse 19. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. I will eat the good of the land because I am willing. I said because I am willing. Willing to repent and willing to do the will of God. Look at chapter 4. Chapter 4 verse 3. And it shall come to pass that... He that is left in Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem, shall be called holy. Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. I see, I was saying, you know, when you repent and when you turn and you give your life over to the Lord again, He will cleanse you. He will put you and he will pardon you and he will so pardon you he will even write your name among the living and also he'll make you holy look at chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 26 chapter 5 verse 26 and he will lift up an ensign to the nations from farm and will his unto them 
from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. That means uh, when the people of God have cleansed themselves and they have adjusted their lives and they're living the way God wants them to live without copying the world, without running after the world, the work of God will not prosper in their hands and people will be coming from everywhere and they will honor the Lord through their lives and through their example and through their ministries in Jesus name now we come to point number two an instructive confession and perception within the fold we are coming back to chapter 6 Isaiah had seen the vision and the vision is so made him to see how holy God was holy 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 is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Of course, he himself had been born again in the language of the New Testament. His sins had been forgiven. He was a new creature in the Lord. But now, comparing his life with the holiness of God that he saw, com com uh, comparing you know, his behavior, his character, and his uh, thought and attitude with the glory of the Holy Holiness of God that he saw, that's why he now said in verse 5, And then said I, who is me? If God is so holy like this, and my holiness that I've been, you know, carrying about, and I've been talking to the children of Israel, and I've been preaching to them, if my holiness is like this, and his holiness is like that, who is me if I am undone? Because I'm a man of unclean leaves, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean leaves. He said, For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of uh, the Lord of hosts. He saw the glory of God, he saw the majesty of God, and he saw the holiness of God. And because of what he saw, he said, I'm nowhere. Comparing myself with the Almighty, I am nowhere. And comparing myself with, um, with the angels of God, how they run swiftly in doing the work of God, I am nowhere. And so he said, woe is me. Woe is me. Uh, let us come back to chapter 3 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 9. He had used that same language before. Look at this, chapter 3, verse 9. Uh, then the, the, the show of their countenance witnesses against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom, and they hide it not. Woe unto their soul. He was pointing to other people before that time. He had not seen the glory of God. And he thought, I'm all right. I'm saved. I'm all right. I'm pardoned. I'm all right. I'm living clean. I'm all right. I'm better than they are. And so, I'm okay. Blessed is me. And woe is unto them. And then he goes on to say, after saying a woe to their soul, for they have regarded, they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Look at verse 11. Woe unto the wicked. You know, I'm not wicked, I'm righteous, I'm walking in the way of the Lord. I'm a believer, they are unbelievers. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. And let's come to chapter 5, verse 15. As he mentioned, woe unto the people that were not living right. He said, woe unto them that draw iniquity or the cause of vanity. They are vain, they are proud, and they manifest being glory, and they draw iniquity, they draw sin or the cause of vanity. They don't care what they do, they live carelessly. Woe unto them. And sin, uh, they, they draw sin as it were with a catch rope. And then he goes on in verse 20. Look at verse 20. It says, One to them. All this time, before he saw the new vision, 
all this time before he saw the glory of the holiness the majesty of the holiness of God it was one to them one to them one to them but after he saw the glory of God and he compared who he was with who with who God was he was now said one to me verse 21 to them that call evil good and good evil one to them that put darkness for light and light for darkness one to them that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter verse 21 one to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight verse 22 one to them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength that mingle strong drink uh, that mingle strong drink we justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him one to them but now he realizes it's not just them when I compare myself with God when you compare yourself with Christ when we compare ourselves with the holiness that demanded of God holiness in heart holiness in spirit holiness in thought holiness in attitude holiness in action holiness that makes us to do as the angels would do if they were in our place when you compare yourself with the almighty God you'll have to stop saying one to them one to them but now woe unto me look at the way I am I shouldn't die in this condition there must be a cleansing there must be a purging there must be a deeper kind of holiness there must be sanctification and you know what he also said I see chapter 6 I'm reading from verse 5 here when he say and I said then said I woe is me for I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean leaves he was actually talking about the original sin. He said, when I am forgiven, I'm pardoned. I thank God because of the initial cleansing, but there's still something. And I notice that I am not like I ought to be. I know what I ought to be. And I know the level I ought to be, but I'm not there yet. That's why he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. You know, people of God have felt like that too you after they have been pardoned and even after God has said you are my child, you are my son, you are my daughter, yet they discover something in their inward part, they discover something in their soul, they discover something in their inner life that still ought to be cleansed, look at Job chapter 42, Job chapter 42 and I'm reading here from verses 5 and 6 this is Job I have heard thee by the hearing of the ear but now mine eye sees thee you see when we see the Lord and we see his glory his majesty his holiness and we see his uprightness and we see his faithfulness we will have to come to this conclusion in verse 6 wherefore I have for myself and repent in dust and ashes you know he had been arguing with his friends before you don't understand I know I am righteous you don't understand I know that my redeemer leave it you don't understand I know that I'm up here but now he saw the Lord and the Lord began to ask him questions and he saw the original depravity in his heart he said Lord I see you now I cannot argue anymore I abhor myself in dust and ashes and let's look at Psalm 51 Psalm 51 I'm reading here from verse 1 it's from verse 5 Psalm 51 verse 5 behold I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me David is not talking about the original sin it says uh, you know I've been saying a uh, blessed is your sin is forgiven blessed is your sin is covered blessed is you unto whom you are not impute iniquity I realized something now even after that forgiveness I realize something now even that first work of grace there is still something you know, that needs to be taken away because I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me and uh, now we're coming back to Isaiah chapter 6 
Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 5 again, when he said, and Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verse 5, then said, I woe is me, for I'm undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. Look at this, look at this. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. You know what? Perception within the fold. Perception with all the other people too. I see it too now. Although those people are saved, although those people are pardoned, although those people have got the first work of grace, I also see something in them that should not be there. They too should have the second work of grace in them. I dwell in the midst of these people. Look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 9. And we're reading from verse 6. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 6, Thine habitation is in the midst of the siege. Habitation. Maybe you are saved, but look at the people around you. And through the siege, they refuse to know me, says the Lord. That's what Isaiah is saying. He's saying, I'm looking around, and I see deception all around. I see lying all around. I see sincerity all around. I see people that claim to be Israelites, and yet my habitation is among the people that refuse to know the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord of us, Behold, I will melt them and try them for how shall I deal for the daughter of my people. Their tongue is as an arrow shot out, and it speaketh deceit. One speaketh peacefully to his neighbor. He said, these are the people in the midst of whom I'm living. They speak peacefully with their neighbors, with their mouth, but their hearts let wait, let wait for those people. Shall I not visit them for these things? Says the Lord, shall not my soul be avenged on a nation as this? As you look around you, you are saved, you are born again. And you have the peace of God in your heart. And then you look around the community, the violence, the fighting, the lying, the deception, the covetousness, the corruption. And it breaks your heart. Why should a nation be like this? But Isaiah was not only concerned for the people, he was also concerned for himself. Point number three now is instantaneous cleansing and purging with fire. Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from up the altar, and he laid it on my mouth. Sanctification sometimes can become painful. He laid the live coal on his mouth and it's instantaneous it was at that very moment at that very instance that he was sanctified because look at this read on and he laid it on my mouth and he, and he said lo lo this has touched thy lips the iniquity is taken away then iniquity, that's the original sin, not iniquities in the plural, not sins in the plural. When we're saved, our sins in the plural are forgiven. When we're born again, our iniquities in the plural are taken away. But now, the original sin, the depravity, that inward iniquity, that nature of sin, that body of sin is taken away at this second touch from the Lord. It says, Lo, this has touched thy leaves, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy, tell me, sin, plural or singular, Plural or singular? Singular. That's the original sin. That one is taken away. If uh, we have not got it, we well, will get it. Sanctification. Purity. And the cleansing of the heart and of the inner man. It will be done in Jesus' name. Uh, look at Malachi chapter 3 verse 3. Malachi chapter 3. 
and I'm reading from verse 3. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 3, look at what it says here. Malachi 3, verse 3. It says in verse 3, it says, And he shall see it as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. Let's refer it to you, we're workers. And we're, pre we're preachers, we're the people leading the people of God. And it says, he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. That's the reason why God revealed um, his holiness unto I say, the reason is that he wanted him to see that he had not arrived. Although he had been pardoned, although he had been preaching from chapters 1 to 5, he had not arrived. That's the reason why God reveals his holiness and his purity and his majesty unto us. That even though we have been workers, even though he has allowed us to be at his work, to be at our post and at our duty, we have not arrived. He still wants to do something in us that we'll never, we'll never forget. He'll purge us. He'll purify us. And when he does, we'll be more serviceable and more useful, profitable in the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. Look at John chapter 15 verse 1. John chapter 15 verse 1. I am the true vine and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth fruit that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Underline that in your Bible. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, what does he do? Say, say, say it aloud. He taketh away. You know, there, there are people that do not understand the Bible well. They say they are born again. They say they are working for the Lord. And they say, well, I'm a worker, I'm a worker. If I don't go to the workers' meeting, nobody can remove me. If I don't bear fruit, nobody can remove me. If the house fellowship goes on and, you know, I never go there, I don't, you know, show interest. But if we are going to have workers' retreat, I'll quickly register, I'll be there. If they're going to have a leadership strategy congress and they're allowing all the workers to come, I will quickly, you know, go and register. I must be there. They want to be at those special meetings for the prestige of being in that meeting and carrying the booklet and saying, you know, I was there. I'm part of the workers. I'm significant. I'm important. But they never do the work. And their leaders never talk to them. Their leaders cannot even talk to them. Their leaders cannot remove them. And if their leaders want to approach them, they'll, you know, have a stony face and say, uh-huh. What? What do you want to say? I want you want to say that this and don't you see the road? Don't you see the hold up? Don't you see all the difficulties and all the challenges? You want me to, you know, get into that kind of traffic. That's why I'm not there. When things improve, then I'll be there. But remember that you cannot touch me. If you try to remove my name, I will write to the GS and report to you and say you are victimizing me and you are persecuting me and the GS doesn't like any leader persecuting any member and therefore, you, you know, they are there. But if they cannot remove you, the Father can remove such a person. I pray the Father will not do that to you. I said they will not do that to you. Of course you are here. I'm talking about people who are not here. You are faithful, you remain faithful. Amen. You are diligent, you remain diligent. And whenever there is any discouragement, you will remember, my father in the Lord is going to be there. And he's older than I am. And if he's still able to, you know, run up and run down, and he has passed the power and the anointing to us, and I got the anointing, and I got the anointing, if he is still able to run up and down, I will run like he's running. More strength unto you. More power in your life. More anointing in your life in Jesus' name. 
look at verse 2 look at verse 2 every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit he purges it you see there's purging i say i got the purging already when he says every branch that beareth fruit that means already in christ you're already a child of god and you are bearing fruit already and he still purges that he may bear more fruit you'll bear more fruit and then uh, we come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. We're reading from verse 9. The purging is the purifying. And that's what was done for Isaiah. And that's what was done, will be done in our lives. In my life. In your life. In every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Look at verse 9, Acts chapter 15, verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. He will do it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Purging, purifying. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Old life must not be in us. Old habits will not be in us. Old carelessness will not be in us. Old careless language will not be in us in Jesus' name. Purge out the old leaven, that she may be new lamb, as she are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, verse 8, let us keep the feast, with, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. No malice in our midst. You know, I cannot imagine a worker, I cannot imagine a real believer saying, I will not greet her, I will not greet him. If he greets me and just, you know, shrug my shoulder, I will not answer. No malice in our midst. You don't appear like people who are malicious. You look like children of God. You look like saints of God. And that saintliness will be shown in every one of our lives and our relationship together in Jesus' name. And that's why it says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven of, uh, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of, somebody tell me, sincerity and truth. Amen for you. Yeah. Amen for every one of us. Yeah. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And we're reading from verse um, 14. Titus chapter 2. We're reading from verse 14. It says in verse 14, Titus chapter 2, gave himself for us. Who gave himself for me? Who gave himself for me? Every work of grace will be accomplished in your life. Already he gave himself for you. He died for you. He shed his blood for you. And the reason why he shed his blood for you will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from... That he might redeem you from... All iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You know, sometimes you look at a brother, you look at his sister, he's so zealous and she's so zealous, and inside yourself, you're wondering, can I ever be that zealous? Your time has come. You'll be a peculiar person. You'll be a peculiar believer. In fact, you'll be so zealous, you'll pinch yourself and say, Is this me? Is the new you? Is the rebranded you? And is the transformed you? You will be peculiar, you'll be zealous in Jesus' name. As a work for God is peculiar, so your blessing will be peculiar. 
as your zeal for God is peculiar, so the reward will be peculiar in your life in Jesus' name. Point number four now, the individual consecration and pursuit with focus. The individual consecration and pursuit with focus. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Hold on. Some people never hear the voice of the Lord except one time. When they were seriously praying for marriage, for a life partner, for a sister, for a brother. And they prayed and they prayed and they fasted and the Lord spoke to them. And he said, that's the woman, that's the sister, that's my daughter. I made her ready for you. Or talking to the sister, that's the man, that's my son. I gave him to you, bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. That's the only time they have heard from the Lord. But the time has now come. Amen. We will hear the voice of the Lord. Amen. Think about it, think about it. What if Isaiah did not hear the voice of the Lord? What if Isaiah did not have this new challenge and this new ministry given to him? Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, will not be there. What if uh, he has not heard the voice of God anew? Chapter 7, his name shall be called Emmanuel, that one will not be there. What if he has not heard the voice of God anew, that somebody will come and make the way, like the word for John the Baptist to come? That revelation will not be there. What if he had not heard the voice of God? His continued ministry will not just have, been, have continued the same old way. One to them, one to them, one to them. He'll be a prophet of war, a prophet of doom. But now he heard the voice of the Lord and he said, By his stripes were healed. All our iniquities are laid upon him. And he spoke about Christ and spoke about new heaven and he knew what? Because he had a renewed ministry. You see, there are people, all they can tell is, you know, from 19 such and such have been working for God, and from 2015, uh, you know, joined the workforce. Uh, it's only that story they tell. But the new voice of the Lord coming unto them, it will come to you. I said it will come to you when you plunge yourself uh, in the ocean of uh, you know the, the promises of God and then you pray with fervency and you wait upon the Lord and you say I want a new sin, I want to I want revival in my soul revival in my spirit and I want to hear the voice of God afresh that voice of God will come to you also I heard the voice of the Lord saying who shall I send and who will go for us. Look at God almost pleading. Look at God uh, demanding and look at God saying, uh, I have all these people I've created. Any of them could be my servant. Any of them could do my will. Who will I send? Who is making himself ready? Who is making himself available? Whom shall I send? And when I send him, he will consecrate and he will concentrate on my work alone. And he will know that I'm a servant of the king and I'm working for the king. I will not, you know, be working for the king and working for another, you know, contrary personality. I'll not work for Christ and work for Satan. At the same time, I'm going to dedicate Dedicate myself and commit myself. Who is willing to go like that? Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? That anywhere he goes, they will know I'm for the Lord. I'm a servant of the Lord. I'm a steward of the Lord. I'm a preacher for the Lord. I'm the saint one in my community. Then said I, here am I, send me. After he had been purged, here am I, send me. After you have been empowered, here am I, send me. After you have been purified and prepared, here am I, send me. The Lord is looking for renewed servants today who will do something great and do exploits in this hour. And I know somebody is there tonight saying, here am I, send me. A sister is there saying tonight, here am I, send me. I know a brother is there he is saying tonight, here am I, send me you will go for the Lord and you will succeed 
and the work will prosper in your hand. Every danger and every situation you meet in the way, it will send the singers from above. It will clear all those things out of your way in Jesus' name. Lions will not devour you. Bears will not terrorize you. Pharisees will not kill you or destroy you. And anything in your way, anything in the way, is going to be taken out of your way in Jesus' name. Like Isaiah responded, you will respond. Like Isaiah went, you will go. And like he succeeded, nothing was able to hinder him. You will do it as well in Jesus' name. Anyone getting ready there? Who shall I say that no will go for us? Anyone saying, here am I? Anyone saying, here am I? Anyone saying, here am I? Send me. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord. Oh Lord, here am I. Send me. The Lord is sending you now. Look at chapter 26 of Acts. Acts chapter 26. And I'm reading from verse 16. Acts chapter 26 verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. To make thee a minister. Anybody there? He'll make you a minister. And then he says, And he witnessed both of those things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send you. They will not touch your life. They will not ruin your life. The Lord will deliver you from every danger in Jesus' name. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Anyone that is oppressed, anyone that is under a yoke of Satan, when you speak the word, you will break that yoke. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Can we say that together? Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Can we read that again? A new vision, a new strength, a new power, a new ability, a new victory. That thing we have been reading about that you know you've been waiting for, that you'll be more than a conqueror, it's now beginning to be fulfilled. Rise up and tell the Lord I'm ready. Who shall who will go for us? And who will who shall I say? And who will go for us? Then you are telling the Lord, Oh Lord, here am I, oh Lord, here am I, oh Lord, here am I, send me. You are going to see a new power in your life, a new anointing in your life, a new authority in your life, a new success in your life. Here am I, send me. He's sending you now and you must do something higher than what you were doing before, greater than what you were doing before, and more successful than what you were doing before. Here am I, send me.